Well, it's too bad all of those different centers uh, had to go bankrupt, but I can see why they would. There was a fellow at, at uh, Lisbon, New Jersey, uh, Dave Dobbs died, I think, last year. Dave Dobbs is the one that signed my HDA certificate. But there was another fellow that came in to uh, handle, the dict handle the dictaphone machine. His name was Maloney. And Maloney saw such a mess uh, management-wise that he talked himself into a job there. And then when the foundations failed, he talked Purcell into a job there. So Maloney was uh, was business manager for for Purcell in Wichita. Wow. Did you move from, uh, did you sort of track with uh, the organization? I mean, your jobs, your career, uh, going from... Uh, no, I, uh, I, I left my job in Mason City, Iowa, and sold my uh, life insurance that my parents have been paying for for years in order to pay for the HDA course in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I moved my family, which I had one boy at the time, uh, He's the one that became a medical doctor, is now retired. And uh, I moved them down to Mobile, Alabama, where her parents and, and uh, sister and brothers lived. And uh, I drove from Mobile up to Elizabeth, New Jersey, and uh, that's how I took the course. And, and uh, before I left, I set up a, a uh, Dianetic group in Mobile, Alabama, and another one in Fairhope, Alabama. And one of the people that I had there was a fellow by the name of McDade. McDade was a very wealthy man at the time. He he owned a coffee plantation in Brazil, and he owned the largest orchid uh, nursery in, in the world. Uh, it's in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, he owned uh, a nursery in Mobile, Alabama, and a large uh, soft drink bottling plant in Atlanta, Georgia, and a, a very large news distributing agency. Well, he was, he, he had been under, under psychiatric care. He just spent, I think, about $150,000 on psychiatrists and had no help. So wow. when he heard about Dianetics, uh, he hired me to work with him. And uh, I'll tell you the truth, I think even to this day, I couldn't have done anything to help him. but. He was in real sad shape and his whole empire was falling apart as well as his marriage and his relationship with his children and everything else. But uh, I was probably one of the very, very few across the nation at the time that had a paying pre-care, pre-clear. <laughs> uh, they were very, very uh, few and far between. And that was my pain. It was Clint McDade. And, uh, when I got to Elizabeth, New Jersey, on the, just before I started back, I changed the oil in the car, and the, and the filling station uh, people left the cap off, so my engine burned out oh, just wow. a few miles down the road. I had to call Clint and get some money from him to get the car repaired so I could drive back home. But I got home and I worked with Clint a while, um, and I decided I just didn't know enough. So uh, at that time there was a uh, auditor's convention in Wichita. And I had Clinton and several other people drive up to Wichita with me to go to that convention. And uh, while I was there, um, I learned that Hubbard had two auditors, a man and a woman. And uh, they, wanted, they wanted to leave Hubbard, and I wanted to stay there. So they took over Clint McDade. They felt they could do something with him. And I stayed there and was offered a job in the uh, processing center by Ross Lamerle. And uh, it was at that time that, uh, that I also got to work for Hubbard on a number of things. Could you talk about any of those things uh, that you worked with him on? 
Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's all in that in that manuscript I gave you. Uh, main thing I was hired for him, by him for was uh, because of my mathematic background to to lay out postulates and axioms on Dianetic Scientology. Mm -hmm. And I worked with it a little while and decided I just couldn't do what he wanted. So he usually worked at night and he sat up all night and he gave me a, a magnetic tape of what he had quoted. And I took that to the girls and had it transcribed. And then I cut it up into pieces and organized it and brought it to him. And then he cut it up in pieces and reorganized it. And we did that a while until we finally satisfied with the axioms and postulates of, of Dianetics, Dianetics and Scientology. Uh, there were two axioms of mine that I recommended that he kept in there. And uh, you remember what they were? Oh yeah. Uh, are you familiar with uh, are you familiar with uh, definitions of extension, intention and operational? These are philosophical terms. Intentions, I-N-T-I-O-N. Intention. I-O-N. Yeah. Extension. Extension. E-X-T-E-N-T-I-O-N. Extension. S-I-O-N, not T-I-O-N. S-I-O-N. Right. And intention, the same. Uh, in philosophy or mathematics, you have a... Uh, you have a definition of definitions if you you have an extensional definition is like the kind that uh, uh, Aristotle used to use if you want to define this table uh, it's got a certain flatness it's made out of such and such and it's so high and you just go on forever describing characteristics that's an extensional definition intentional definition is uh, where you define something by what it is not. You say, uh, this is a set of uh, all elements that are not positive. Or all, you say, this is a set of all numbers that are not positive. That would be the intentional. The operational type would be more like Einstein uh, described. He says, you only know things in terms of the devices you use to to measure them in an operational definition. So in, uh, in Hubbard's uh, postulates and axioms, he's, he reworded that, so he's talking about, uh, uh, let's see, what did he have in there? Uh, primarily, I think, uh, intention and operational, but he used different words 